Hello, my name is Etzko Skatema and I'd like to take the opportunity to explore a phenomenon which we at Skatema refer to as surrogate management or the issue of surrogate management. Now surrogate management is, 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 is born from or is the, the outflow of the prevailing view of how enterprises work. If one listens to how people think and speak about enterprise today, the, there is a view that people who run enterprises are there to produce a result by managing resources to that end, which basically suggests that the better that they are at managing resources, the more value is added and the more successful the enterprise would become. This idiom has almost a mechanical implication. It says that the, if you, from the point of view of the people running the business, they would view the business as a machine that they get to do things that then produces a result. Um, consistent with this mechanical view is that if the machine breaks and uh, desperately requires to be fixed, then you would call in the services of a specialist mechanic that would fix your organization for you. The problem with this view is that it doesn't quite do justice to how results are actually produced. In the first instance, an organization is comprised of people who add value who produce results. These results aren't the product of a system or a process. They're actually the results of the effort or the outcome of the effort of what people do. And how the results are actually produced becomes apparent if we use a Baker analogy. Or, uh, to understand this. So let's assume we have our three people in this enterprise are actually bakers and they work together to produce a cake. Uh, it's, it takes them a whole month to produce this particularly difficult cake to bake and at the end of the month the cake is sold. The first slice of the cake the first baker takes home to feed her family, the second slice of the cake the second baker takes home to feed his family and the third slice of the cake which is the biggest slice of the cake the boss takes home to feed his family. Now, clearly, the slice that's left is the surplus. And it is this slice which really designates the success of an enterprise. In most enterprises, we would consider the success of an enterprise, the real results of an enterprise, to be the profit that it produces. And a profit is very similar to a surplus. A profit is basically saying it's the piece of the cake that was left after everybody had taken a piece home. Now, this surplus has a very interesting character. In the first instance, it only exists because the entire cake that was baked was bigger than what each individual took home. In other words, the only reason why the surplus exists is because collectively, the individuals in the business gave more than what they took. That therefore suggests that the surplus is the measure of the degree to which each person in the enterprise gave unconditionally in pursuit of the group's objectives. It is the degree to which people are willing to go the extra mile, are committed to the enterprise, is the degree to which the enterprise produces a result. Now, the first important thing to bear in mind about the conditions whereby people commit to an enterprise is that they don't do that for the enterprise. At the end of the day, people do this for people. So if we consider our three members of this business and say, well, what actually creates the conditions that they commit this is really got, uh, concerned with the degree to which they commit to the boss and the boss's right, if you like, to ask them to go the extra mile. Now, we've done research at the Chamber of Mines in the early 80s, which has been repeated throughout the world, which basically suggests that when people work for a boss that they commit to, they work for that boss because they want to. And when you ask people to describe the boss they would work for because they want to, these are sort of the typical kinds of reasons that people would put forward. They'd say the boss listens, is supportive, is approachable, has empathy, is honest, is fair, gives feedback, and so on. You could elicit a lot of criteria to the question of why people will work for a boss because they want to. But it will always fit these two themes, this green theme and the red theme that we've indicated here. The green theme has a kind and a soft feel about it. And it is really concerned with the issue of care. If you, for instance, if you are able to listen to somebody, that means that you are able to suspend your agenda for their agenda. In other words, you've got a sincere interest in the person. You're not there to get something out of the person. 
Being supportive, having empathy implies the same thing. Being approachable implies the same thing. So in the first instance, the, the kinds of material that people would put on the table if they described the boss that they would work for because they want to resonate with the idea of care. The boss cares for me. But then there's a harder theme. If you work for a boss who's always honest, is fair, and gives feedback, it is not because the person is always nice. I mean, a, an honest person will sometimes say upsetting things. But the benefit to the subordinate when the boss is honest is that the subordinate knows where they stand. They therefore learn and they grow. So the benefit to the subordinate of, these, of the harder theme is growth. Which means to say, if people work for a boss because they want to, it is not because the boss does many things. Actually, the boss is only doing two things. The boss cares for the subordinate and gives the opportunity for the subordinate to grow. Now, we've discovered that those two themes are universal. They're true for every human being on the planet. Wherever you go, if you ask somebody who's the boss that they work for, work for because they want to, they would say, the boss who cares for me and grows me. It's important to account for this universality. In a sense, we're asking something quite specific when you're asking people to describe the boss that they would work for because they wanted to. If you work for somebody because you want to, in a sense, what you're doing is that you give that person the right to ask you to do things. I mean, for example, if you worked for somebody who did all this stuff for you, they listened and supportive, they cared for you, they were honest, they gave you feedback, they grew you, and that person came to you one day and asked you to do something, you'd probably do it which means you give that person the right to ask you to do things or to exercise power over you, which means these criteria of care and growth are the criteria for legitimate power. And when you see it from this point of view, the, this, uh, this, the, the, the universality of this criteria make absolute sense. Uh, and, when you, <clears throat> and when you see it from this point of view, the universality of these criteria make absolute sense. And when you see it from this point of view, the universality of these criteria makes absolute sense. The first relationship of power that you have, have had with it, that the first relationship of power that the unibium, the first relationship of power that anyone has had with anybody else is with their parents. And in a sense, if it's a first relationship, we can understand the, the, uh, we can, and in a sense, if it's the first relationship, this is very useful because we have a, an, an intuitive understanding that there's a connection between the idea of first and the idea of principle. So if you want to understand the principle of the matter, examine the first manifestation of the matter. The first manifestation of power is parenting. In that relationship, there are two people, a parent and a child. And the job of the parent for the child is very specific. They care for the child and they give the, the child an opportunity to grow. Now... That means to say that the universal criteria for legitimate power have to do with care and growth. It therefore implies that when the people who do the work experience that the one who's giving the instructions cares for them and grows them, those people then commit to the enterprise and uh, produce the result which the enterprise requires. And in fact, actually go the extra mile in producing that result. However, we do have this mechanical metaphor which basically suggests that when the boss uh, is faced with a situation where something's going wrong, there's some issue with the commitment of people, and the task is challenged, and as a result, the results are under threat, what he would do is he gets a specialist mechanic in, called an HR manager, to go and look after the people so that the people can come and fix, uh, so to look, off, to look after the people so that the people can once again commit to the work. It is considered to be the HR manager's job to look after the people. Now, the problem with this approach, of course, is that the discontent which is causing the dysfunction is actually a result of the boss not caring for and growing the people who are doing the work. And when the boss brings in the HR manager to go and look after the people, what he's really saying to them is that this job of care and growth is not his job. The HR manager has to care for the people. She's got to grow them. Which basically means that this approach entrenches the discontent of the people. And the outcome of that is that the, the task is even under greater crisis and the results are even more challenged.